I think we need to, do we commence now? I believe so. Yep. You can do your presentation now. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Go on. So, welcome um, to the presentation from Curtin University on design for sustainable living, um, space activation for well-being. Um, I'm here. My name is Anne Farron. I'm here with Jake Schapper. Um, and we're pleased to have this opportunity to be part of the Design Day Marathon. Um, we first begin, because we live in um, uh, on Indigenous and traditional um, uh, land, we have a traditional a practice of acknowledging um, the traditional owners. So I'll read this for you, which is Curtin University acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which Curtin, Perth is located. The Wujok people of the Noongar Nation are the traditional owners and we um, honour and respect their uh, ownership of land. Thank you. So this project is, um, we actually have for our um, project of looking at designable, sustainable, designing sustainable wellbeing, we have uh, been approached by a local um, community group and, and local government uh, and the, for this, with this site in mind, it's called Richmond Quarter Piazza um, Redesign. It was built recent uh, five years ago, but unfortunately, the um, the public space in the building is not functioning very well. And so, it's a local project uh, that we are looking at with a the Design Marathon providing us with an opportunity for global input uh, along with our local students. So this will be the focus of, in a sense, a case study for this examination of um, designing sustainable wellbeing and place activation. So there are, uh, the conceptual premise that we're looking at for this project is um, uh, Edward O. Wilson's biophilia, and this is essentially there's a the sort of biophilogist sub hypothesis, which suggests that humans possess an innate tendency to seek connections with nature and other life forms. Um, and this sort of helped reinforce our own well-being and mental health, uh, as well as the fact that we are dependent on other life forms or sustenance uh, and each other for um, most of the um, uh, sustainable well-being and lifestyle uh, choices that we have. I mean, probably the best example of this is pets. Uh, from an animal standpoint, um, you know, many, many people have dogs and cats as a common pet, and they're often called companion pets for that, um, to the point where uh, elderly people who have animals tend to live longer and be more healthy than people who don't actually have pets like um, a cats or a dog. And dog facilitate exercise and those sorts of things. A colleague of mine has a theory called dog devation, which is the um, activation of public open space um, through dog walking. She, she's not very much of a cat person. She said uh, a socialization aspect. Um, the next one is Ray Oldenburg's, the third place. Uh, and it, it, he was a uh, urban anthropologist in the United States. And he came up with this um, theory that we have our usual places, which is the first, which is our home. Uh, and then there is a second space, which is, or place, which is work. Uh, and then there's a real, the other really important third space is public spaces. And in this, uh, he actually spoke about coffee shops, bars, uh, bookstores uh, uh, as being sort of, and, you know, community uh, sports and those sorts of things as being, really essential to the social and civic life of a country uh, and a city. And the, and again, reinforcing that sense of community and socialization. And that's where this uh, third place comes in. So we've been teaching the students who are very much now uh, entrenched in their phones and online digitally. Uh, but, uh, there, there's this old concept and uh, as has been pointed out that actually a lot of the third space now for the current generation takes place on social media and online platforms, which in some respects is um, a little disappointing from some by my students that it is in fact a fantastic way to interact. I'm still skeptical. Uh, uh, then there's a, a really key philosophy that or um, research premise that we use. 
uh, in urban and regional planning, which is William H. White's uh, Life of Small Urban Spaces. And it's actually should be The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. And William H. White was one of the first people to use uh, uh, time-lapse photography to understand how public space was being used. And he did this in the 1970s. Um, today, it's much easier to um, actually run these kind of exercises and do them that way. Uh, elements that create vibrant... And so his, his theory, he did was he looked at a series of... Um, public open spaces in New York, some of them successful, some of them not successful, and then dissected what uh, creates those vibrant public spaces. It's things like seating, shading, uh, thermal comfort, uh, theory called triangulation, which is, you know, people wanting to go and take, uh, you know, to be there and to have a, a similar conversation point between people. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, the purposes of today, because we're uh, limited on time, I'm actually going to focus on an element of biophilia, uh, which is, and that's essentially going to be street trees. But I think, you know, I, I am constantly uh, in my academic and even in the sort of civic life um, espousing how good street trees are in an urban environment and the really vital important role that they play in um, creating livable cities and and with others. So, um, you know, one of the questions that I often ask is, you know, the students and get them to list down is, what are the benefits that street trees have in the urban environment, in an urban environment, and uh, what are the things that should be avoided when planting street trees? So we'll go on to that. I won't play the YouTube video, but um, for those of you who want to look at it later, that's there. So those are two really poignant questions when we're um, thinking about street trees. So here's an example in Sydney of um, some fantastic street trees which provide that urban canopy colour. And you can see here that um, in summer, the space underneath this continuous, continuous canopy is re it actually cools the urban environment significantly. Now, in terms of where we don't actually have issues, uh, we don't have terribly cold winters where um, basically we have what are called cool, wet, uh, cool, wet winters and uh, hot, dry summers. So for us, the this type of structure, even though these aren't deciduous, doesn't really matter that much in winter for us because we don't need that thermal access that uh, many architects bang on about. And really does create a very pleasant, thermally pleasant environment plus visually aesthetic. Okay, so here's, uh, I'm going to give a couple of contrasts of a few different streets around Perth. This one is in uh, uh, of Perth and has some fantastic features here. I would say the trees, the street trees there are generally quite small. They could go bigger, but there's also a huge variety. And you can see how street trees have in softening this landscape, but also setbacks of the buildings. You know, the development model that we have in, in uh, Western Australia is primarily of single houses. The vast majority of housing is single housing on by Asian standards, very large lots, um, in some cases almost agricultural. Uh, and But you can see the setbacks in this particular street are about uh, four to five metres deep and a huge level of vegetation. So there's an interaction uh, which is incredibly pleasant uh, between the street trees and the, the gardens of the um, fronts of these houses. And again, I'll environment for encouraging people to walk around people more you know people who go through walks through their neighborhood to stay health and to meet people and to socialize um, this type of environment is fantastic now here's another interesting street this is actually uh one street in highgate this is Smith street and the street here has got one type of tree. 
it uh, ficus, uh, and it has a very dead canopy, as you can see here, uh, and very little light gets under, underneath. Now, the upshot of that is that very little grows underneath this, but it is still a really impressive uh, framing element of this street. And again, incredibly cool in summer, usually 10 degrees cooler than the surrounding streets because of the way this has um, occurred. But it does also, the fox also drops the fig like um, berry, which does um, create a bit of a mess, but uh, personally, uh, I'd like to see something with a little more understory uh, in our streets. Uh, Jake, we might have to move a little bit faster. On sorry, this. yep. Um, this one here, this is a new subdivision in the outer areas of Perth. And as you could see, the lack of street trees actually creates a really hostile, barren work uh, environment here. And to the point where on the right-hand side, you could see that the people with the guys parking is four-wheel drive. That is not actually really lawn. That is um, artificial turf made of plastic. Um, and, you know, this is a sort of apocalyptic landscape, really. And you can see that I don't think this contributes much to the mental well-being of uh, its inhabitants. Uh, again, a similar scenario here. I will skip through. Uh, there's an inappropriate planning. There's a tree there, which is uh, uh, from, I believe it's South America. I forget the species name. Uh, but it doesn't grow much larger than that. And there's not enough planted. And there's only, you know, three in a, a basically a 500-metre line. And they they will not contribute in the same way. And again, a rather hostile environment. Okay, ecology of street trees is really important as well. You know, bird bird watching. I think a lot of people are very happy to hear birds. I know there's a tradition in China of keeping songbirds and drinking tea. Uh, I've seen enough of the Chow Yung Fa movies from Hong Kong in the uh, 90s um, where they had a few scenes of uh, that sort of stuff. Um, so... We've got some ecological aspect here that when we plant natives, we actually encourage the native animals to come in and we can make some uh, street fencing choices as well. So on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see there is a fence. And that's actually really good for the ringtailed possums, which are uh, above there, uh, for crawling along, uh, for climbing along and not hitting the ground. Um, because if they get onto the ground, it will be easier for cats uh, and other predators to get the numbers fall. So, you know, when we design these sorts of things, it's really important to make sure that we take care of the actual animals. Um, and this is so, part of that sustainability thing that we'll talk about a bit more. Yeah. And look, it's also important to remember when looking at your street tree plantings that uh, do Indigenous trees promote more biodiversity than alien ones? And you can actually see that there it's a sort of bit of a mixed bag there. But generally speaking, particularly for birds, this was a study that was done in North America, that for birds and for nesting, which nests, um, you can see that native, native bird, bird life, is actually better supported by indigenous trees uh, rather than introduced ones because, you know, evolution has adapted over time. Um, and they're much more suitable. So when you're considering planting in your local area a tree, try to pick something from that biodiversity area and you'll be paid back by more bird visits. Um, uh, then again, you can see here, there's also a correlation between the number of bird species and actually the physical number of trees planted in a space or in a street. So the more trees you plant, the more birds that you will get and the more species of birds that you will get. So there is a direct correlation between those two things. So that's again, really important and why we need to plant more trees. Um, again, going back to that component there because it encourages more life and um, cities need more life, both human and non-human. Um, energy saving of shade trees. So I'll just go through quickly. Uh, you know, they could trees change the environment. In Australia, we have issues with heat uh, primarily, and they can reduce um, they can reduce the power the consumption power consumption of a house in summer through um, through shading, and that reduces air conditioning costs by as much as twenty percent in a couple of studies. Um, 
Trees can help small houses keep cool and break even for heating. So again, here's some stats, stats that were done by one study that show that essentially it's a really good prospect to planting trees around homes and apartment blocks. Um, trees also cool just through precipitation. They capture and store carbon. Um, they help in the air, which is all about um, that sustainable element and that sustainable, healthy lifestyles that really help. Uh, we really should be planting more trees is the upgot and more vegetation because it's not it goes beyond the, um, just trees as well. But um, trees are really an easy way to uh, get that type. Ben, over to you. Can you? Yeah. Um, so we're, there's a nice segue into our talk about sustainability. We tend to, the United Nations has um, put, been very active in putting out the sustainable um, goals system. But more recently, we have um, commentary by uh, academics such as Simona Costanza So, who proposes a new approach which is much broader. Um, so you can see on this slide, um, Jake, I think that's gone to small. I don't know if it's sharing properly. Anyway, in this, in the Richmond Quarter project, what we have is uh, she, these have become five pillars. And our project is actually looking at partnerships, um, the um, social aspect and the environmental aspect within these, um, these five pillars. Uh, and um, we have with multi um, stakeholder engagement in uh, as key to the whole project. So if you go to the next slide, Jake. So in terms of looking at more closely at those three components that um, we're considering in our in the um, sustainable wellbeing project that we have, partnerships is a really important one. Um, and for quite a few years, I worked with local government. Uh, so this this draws on some examples from local government in terms of how you and the significance of stakeholder engagement and, and communications with them. So these object, the objectives we have um, in engagement are to ensure residents and key stakeholders are kept engaged, well informed and connected to their community through regular communication and updates. Um, and we have been discussed with in consultation with the um, residents and resident representation representative groups um, for some months now. Uh, in prior to uh, develop the engagement of students' involvement in uh, the um, consultation with with the local broader community, so we've um, we've got the residents' groups, we've got local community people that came and have started to engage with us. Um, who else have we had? There's there were just people that were walking in off the street, so they're just local community. They're not actual residents. The council, the local council is involved. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that everyone has um, a strong uh, ownership of the development and uh, the process of re-engaging this um, centre, making it much uh, much more what it was designed to be. So we've also had businesses, local businesses have uh, representatives came to a consultation session that we've had that we'll talk about a little bit later as well uh, and show you um, how that went. So we'll go to the next slide, please, Jake. So social, social activ activation creates a sense of, of place and encouraging and encourages well-being. So what we're, that first phase of engaging community is really critical. Um, we're also looking at lifestyle activation. A lot of the input that we've had from the residents is around what they would like to see happening in the space. Now, it, 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 because it is a residential area, that is quite interesting because we have diversity in terms of what they want. People, I think we've got a slide later that talks a little bit about, you know, noise. People don't want noise or they want to have um, opportunity to, to be able to be active. They want uh, to do some kind of sporting activity. Others are looking at they just want a little quiet space to sit and be protected from the wind, which is a bit of a factor, and they want to be protected from the sun. That, as Jake was talking about, unfortunately, this piazza that we're looking at was it was meant to have a lot more growth and uh, overhang of um, foliage than it ha currently has. So we're actually trying to address that. And we're also looking at, um, in the longer term, some pop-up activation, which means that we're going to look at the possibility of turning it into a little bit of a marketplace, again, activating the space to bring the broader community into and engaging with 
um, lifestyle um, activity within the piazza. The next one, Jake. And environment, um, we'll talk much more uh, in depth around the environment and sustainable activation using the landscaping, uh, materials, upcycling, and Jake's talked a lot about um, the trees. Did you want to add some more to that one, the environment one, Jake? That's good. Yep. Okay, we'll move on because we're running out of time. This is the site. I'll hand to Jake to talk about the site. The students have done a bit of psych, uh, site uh, analysis, the aesthetics and physical analysis. You can see from this it looks pretty bland for a – it's not a very inviting space anyway. Yeah, so um, the component here that's really interesting is that the council's requirements for this building was for a zero lot set from the um, Canning Highway, which is over the other side of this um, uh, over the other side of this building. Um, we're in the southern hemisphere, so the uh, sun is in the northern part of the sky for most of the year, and particularly at this time of the year where we're in Sydney at the moment, which means that the plaza is more or less fully shaded uh, all, um, all year round, uh, with the exception of, um, you know, sort of minute amount of shade in the, in the summer. Uh, as a result, uh, vegetation has not grown as rigorously. The additional part here is that the um, planter beds that you can see there are not particularly deep. So the structures in the middle, that look old, um, they're not much deeper than what you see there in terms of where the roots can go, which has sort of stunted the growth of the bougainvillea that's been planted there, um, which was early, and you can just see it ever so faintly. You can see that there's actually metal wire that's connected to the tops of the sh of that um, metal pyramid, uh, and the, the the idea was from the architects that the vines would grow up and along those wires. Now they've been in place for five years, and only now are they starting to get some growth up the top because it's just direct sunlight and um, yeah. soil depth for them to deal with. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the pictures are uh, basically facing west. They're looking to the west. And we get a very strong breeze through this space because that's where the ocean is and it comes inland. So where the wind travels east from a westerly direction, as it's called. And basically what happens is the gap in the lower part, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see two pits. The wind essentially comes rushing through that space and all through this piazza because so then it's a windswept, cold environment for um, anybody to be in. And as a result, a number of businesses, uh, there was a cafe we sort of said that we were going to start up there, but it hasn't. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it's quite problematic in that sense. It's just a barren large hostile piece of concrete um that really needs to have something done with it and did you want to add anything no i think i think the vi visuals actually speak for themselves and uh the image on the left actually is where the cafe was supposed to be which would have obviously activated this space a lot more and made it much more inviting and um engaged the community i think we go to the next one jake Yep. Can you see it, Anne? Yeah, yeah. It just shows the students measuring um, the site and having some preliminary um, orientation. In, and there's images of different angles, different viewpoints of the the new development. Yeah. And one of the basic premises of the study that we did is to make sure that uh, don't trust the architects and building drawings because um, maybe it's not even the architect's fault it's um the construction company might have got it wrong so we just have to double check everything and so the students get a sense of what's proper and right and it's also good exercise for getting them to be able to um uh, understand interestingly enough you could see the green vegetation on the ground, ground just next to where the gentleman in the purple shirt is that's actually parsley which is a um uh, they tried planting tomatoes and those sorts of things. They didn't do too well, but the parsley seems to do really well in this area, um, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. 
And we'll talk a little bit about a project that we did that um, uh, involved growing up food. So sustainably looking at those spaces, might we might be able to integrate ideas around uh, a balcony project that came from a balcony project that we'll show later. Jake, do you want yes. to talk about this? Uh, okay, so um, this is uh, this is basically our site. I'm not sure if you could see it yet. So I'm assuming you can see my cursor. See where what is the the church, the white building in the foreground here? That is actually the council building, and our mm -hmm. building now is right next to it. So there was actually several um, heritage buildings that were demolished in this area, including including a theatre. Um, which is this long spire. But I was actually surprised to learn when we were doing research on this that there was a church that was demolished also um, as a result uh, in this area, um, which actually doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Not that I'm a religious person, but they tend to be quite significant pieces of architecture. So I was surprised mm -hmm. about the demolition of it. Um, the council building still remains. That's the white one again in the foreground. Um, but everything else has been completely removed and redeveloped along this um, piazza type area. Uh, and did you want to mention the indigenous um, yeah. component of history? We're, um, it's been great in recent years that there's been a great acknowledgement of the uh, description and the regions that were described by the Indigenous people who were more much more connected to the landscape. And um, this area run is quite a lot, uh, an area described as Bilia wetlands. Uh, well, the wetlands are part of it, but it runs for about a 10-kilometre period um, uh, stretch along the river. Um, or a little bit back from the river as well. Um, so there's some really great stories that we are hoping to get more information about that are local and Indigenous history and um, culture of the local culture that we want to make sure that are considered as part of the um, development of the site. Um, and Jake mentioned previously about native plants and looking for local native plants to use in the, on the site. Um, to encourage the local, um, even if it is just small birds and insects, uh, that might actually you know, make that pla the piazza area a little more inviting than it currently is. So we've had this and, community, yeah, yeah, we've had this community sorry. consultation session, um, tapping into our local knowledge, um, and the methodologies. The students did a great job that we had on working on this all yesterday. Um, so they were engaged with methodologies, including community co-design exercises, where they had already um, developed or resource or sourced some ideas that um, we can show in a minute. Uh, for the response from the people who came to the session yesterday. Um, so the ideas and, uh, and opinion capturing, there was a lot of that, and they had an online parallel while they were physically in this space that we were able to get an empty shop space for face-to-face you know, -face engagement. They also ran surveys and online questionnaires, which was great because they it I think it probably doubled or uh, at least doubled the... Um, uh, number of um, people that responded, wasn't it, Jake, or might have been even three times. And then we had those community conversations. So if we go to the next one, next slide, this just shows you some of the um, interaction that the students had with different community. Also, this reflects the breadth of um, the community that are uh, have some investment in that space some quite uh there's younger people living in the the uh richmond quarter um and older people uh, so the age range the demographics of the people that need to be consulted is quite broad yeah. and the next is a video yeah yeah we'll play this uh video now and this is just sort of the morning session we did the time lapse um we had i think something's wrong here i'll just play it. um we, we were very lucky in that um, the, there's a number of this area that have done well, uh, particularly there were three in the actual Richmond Quarter building itself. Um, and the local real estate was kind of to have access 
to one of these buildings, uh, to one of these empty shops for us to run the uh, participation exercise in. And you can see at this particular one, there are three tables. Um, I'll play that again. Um, there are three tables. Uh, and these are just yeah, different groups that are working on the projects. And they came up with their own exercises to the community. And the residents came down as well as we grabbed people off the street. Um, and I mean, did their various exercises to different student tables. All similar, but. Um, uh, but not the same. So the, you know, so the quality of data varied depending on how good the students were able to uh, put together their um, their actual process. We we showed them, but we did give them some independence in terms of around how to do that. And the community members who took part really did engage with it quite strongly. And do you want to add anything, Anne? No, I think we go to the next slide because yeah, let's have a look at that. So um, I yes. suppose we, yeah. You want to go? You go. Okay. Um, so, look, the outcome, you know, they, they came back with the, the residents said that they really, really wanted, um, you know, something to happen there and they needed it. Um, they wanted to have it a much better space than it was currently. They wanted activation and they wanted placemaking there. But, and this, this is the, uh, I guess, um, one of the issues of community expectations where it meets reality is that many of the residents are older, uh, particularly in Richmond Quarter. Um, there was a diverse background of people who participated, but a lot of the residents, um, it was it was quite interesting. So it came up with, again, confirmed from our own site, uh, site investigation suspicions, but many of the residents said that um, wind and solar access to the site make the site hard to use, again, because it's cold. Um, essentially, it's cold and quite bleak. Uh, the other problem that we encountered here, and many of the students commented that you can't have both uh, activation and a quiet space. So the residents really didn't want um, people to make any noise whilst they were using the plaza. So they didn't want noisy uses. And we observed that there was actually a uh, sort of gym group uh, that is part uh, that that was operating in the morning uh, within about fifty meters of the uh, of the plaza, but they were doing it in an open um, space grassed area, and that was actually quite active. And there was that was attracting a lot of people, but they were very noisy. And even some of the residents commented they didn't like the outdoor gym people being there because they made a lot of noise in terms of dropping their weights and grunting and making general sound. Um, the, the other issue, and, and this, this is really that contradiction, how do you activate a space and get more people to use it but not have any noise? Um, you know, it's, 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 it can't be done. And it's sort of like I don't think many of the residents aren't actually aware of um, the sort of impossibility of that task in doing it. Um, which is always interesting. Uh, the next one is, and I, I hadn't realized this because East Fremantle is actually quite a wealthy area um, by Perth's in, in, among suburbs in Perth. But there were actually quite a few or there were a number of um, drug affected and homeless people in this area, um, which was qu quite interesting to observe. Um, there is a large supermarket nearby, and it seemed that that was attracting them to an extent, and then added the fact that it was an open space um, type area. Um, and some of the residents have commented on the homelessness, and that they did, you had to make the chairs uncomfortable because you didn't want people standing there too long uh, in that component, which again makes things really difficult in terms of doing that. that that space activization, and this is often the in Australia anyway. I'm not sure what it's like in other places in the world, but the contradiction that everyone wants their cake and um, but they want their cake and they do, and they want to eat it too, um, and it's just not not possible in some respects. So this is, I guess, in some respects, a wicked problem um, of what we can do. Um, and it was interesting to have the students realize some of these contradictions between um, amongst what stakeholders mm -hmm. wanted. And do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that the important thing, it, this does hark back to the significance of the communication. 
um, I think in the first instance, the communication of having different people express their ideas has been great. But I think that it will also make people more aware, all of the stakeholders, of the contradictory um, requirements and expectations. So then navigating through that process, I think is going to be a really rich process for um, the students that are involved with it. I mean, that's a challenge for anyone. As I mentioned earlier, I used to work for local government and that you, you just cannot please everybody. <laughs> so, uh, Not in you, Australia anyway. <laughs> no, definitely not. So, But I think the process is so important uh, and that people are much happier, at least if they have been engaged in that process of communication with each other. And uh, hopefully they do become invested in the outcomes to some degree. And you love this scholarship color. You go for it. So next one. Yeah. Well, the, this was great because part of the consultation process, um, uh, we'd ask the students to at least find or discover um, and bring to for the communication some ideas they might have had for different zones so they could get interaction and reaction from those that they were consulting with during the, um, the sessions yesterday. So one of the things, one of uh, Jake has a, a very big interest in pallets. <laughs> so <he's, laughs> pallet recycling old pallets. So pallets are used to transport um, objects around. They just uh, hopefully that makes sense. And you can see the chess or checkerboard on a, on pallets. I mean, once it's painted, they look pretty cool. Um, the planters that integrate a seat and um, yeah, I think that the integration of seating and um, plants is working really well. The, the top right-hand image shows um, a great little idea for seating that's actually integrated into the stairs because one of the big barriers in the site or on the site is that there is a large um, stairway that becomes almost a barrier. So we're hoping that, you know, by looking at activation of that um, through the aesthetics of it, and the opportunity to actually physically sit and interact and do things in, in on the stairs rather than them just being a functional um, process of getting from one level to another, that these sorts of things will um, help to enliven the, the space. But anyway, these are ideas that the students came up with uh, or they sourced through their research. Um, and Yeah, and <laughs> Pinterest, yeah. But it gave uh, a mechanism to share with the um, the local people and residents to also then get their feedback on what it, I know that there was a fair bit of feedback that people don't like pallets, Jake. So, <laughs> but I think that that the yeah. idea for the students is that they are doing prototyping. So it, while we have access to pallets um, uh, to use, and they're just going to make up the equivalent of prototyping for the activation of the space. And that's what we, we were mentioning about a pop-up. So at the end of the um, project, they the students will be installing um, for feedback, basically. So it's another another um, consultation process is to put their ideas in in physically in the space and therefore have the, um, the response from those who engage with the furnishings or um, activities that they might uh, in, um, develop as part of the project. And this was a great shot, <laughs> Jake. Uh, we've managed to get these pallets from uh, a university site service. Jake, you have to tell the story of your pallet searching and uh, such a beautiful image that the site services guys provided to us to show us that they had managed to locate all these pallets. But I think Jake can tell the story on this one. Yes, well, one of my main concerns is, you know, we we all um, in academia struggle for resources, particularly practical or resource intensive um, units. And um, so, you know, in that idea of um, well-being and sustainability, um, I thought, okay, well, pallets are pretty cheap. They're ubiquitous throughout the world. Everybody knows what they are. Um, and, you know, they're, they're made of wood, which is a good um, a good recyclable material. You know, you can make it into other things, but you can burn it for fuel if you need to, provided it hasn't been treated um, 
uh, too much. And a lot of the parts that he treated, as you're probably aware. Um, so I went down and I thought, you know, we had a number of years ago with um, Professor and his students who came down and we did some stuff out of pallets. And we just got them from around the university. This time we required a lot more. So I went and um, dropped in on site services manager, a, a wonderful gentleman by the name of David Eli. And um, he, uh, he said, I said, look, I need some pallets and told him what we were doing. And he goes, yeah, no problem. And then took me out in the storage yard that Curtin has. Um, he goes, these are all the pallets we're going to chuck away. And I said, wow, well, can I have them? And he goes, sure, not a problem. Um, and asked me, um, and, you know, he was going, I was like, is there any chance of you dropping them over to the uh, workshops? Because we have, uh, we've got workshops with working equipment as well as um, smelters and those sorts of things. I said, is there any chance you're dropping that over there? And I go, yeah, yeah. I said, yes, yeah, we consider it. And I said, look, if you don't have a problem, I'll get the students to come over and drag it, drag them over. And he goes, oh, I'll see what I can do. Uh, I was expecting it's two, it's two to three weeks' time that this was going to sort of happen. But an hour afterwards, I got a, an email from David and he uh, sent me a photo going, uh, already done. Some spare time, so he sorted it out and dropped all of these pallets. And I showed the student students who were gobsmacked um, and also a little frightened about how much work they're going to have to do. <laughs> I think you yeah. dropped out a little bit, Jake. But the I think um, one of the important things is that our university is very supportive of. Um, any kind of recycle and sustainable activity. It's very much um, embedded within the university culture. So uh, we were really pleased to have an opportunity to um, facilitate, well, to engage with different parts of, of the uni. Um, and, I, and you can see as well, I don't, it's possibly not apparent to you, but the garden in the foreground is all Indigenous plants. So again, um, our uh, yeah, at the campus services are making sure that they are looking at what is much more sustainable to grow in our climate. Our climate is pretty harsh and um, it's common sense really to start uh, moving back towards native plants for garden rather than what we have in the past is a lot of um, European imported plants that have used in gardens and unfortunately as the as our climate changes and becomes even um, more challenging, the that's not, not it's just not sustainable in terms of water use and even the plants just are difficult. They just are not surviving as well as they used to in the past. Yeah. So, and I'll stop sharing. And do you want to show All the right. video? Yeah, just the background to um, the sharing of this video that we've got is to finish off is that really this um, project has in some respects been prompted by a collaboration that we did with um, Professor Ding from BIFT. He arranged for some students to come to Curtin University um, in the um, summer of 2019, so the beginning of 2019, our summer it runs across into the beginning of the year. Um, and the students, uh, Jake managed to source again on campus a balcony that wasn't being used. Uh, so we did it, we looked at sustainable food, sustainable living, but looking at food as the focus, growing the plants on the balcony. Um, we had some students working on um, food and uh, looking at um, uh, sourcing just local, all local grown, that we, we didn't use any non-local grown plants because the, the obviously the balcony wasn't going to be, have a, provide us with enough um, food to do it. We had to go and actually buy food. So we were looking at recipes and preparing food over the, the time that um, the team from BIFT were with us. And so this is the little short video that Professor Ding put together and we're really pleased to be able to share that with you. Um, and we hope we get something as equally exciting um, as the outcome from this uh, project. I'll just see if this shares. Da, 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 da. 
don't know what it's doing. No. Um, I can't get it to share. So that I that I don't know how to that's all right like that anyway, isn't it? <laughs> Half screen or how do I get rid of it? I'm not sure. Uh, you got you got to shop stop sharing. Stop sharing. Should be a tab to put the southern side. Uh, or just press escape. Press escape. Oh, there we yeah. are. It's gone. Great. Um, so that kind of winds it up, but we've got time, plenty of time for any questions um, that people might have or comments or feedback. Um, that I think that um, the project that we've had with Professor Ding, there was a lot of it, um, crossovers in terms of, you know, there's possibilities for some of the ideas that we had in that project that you just saw the video on that could integrate into the project that we're doing now. So we're really pleased that there's a really great synergy between those two projects to and continuity because it shows our longer term commitment to this sort of interdisciplinary co-design and um, uh, yeah international project and even though the students will be that are engaging from the design marathon will be online we feel that we can make that a meaningful experience for them uh, and the exchange for our students um, with international students as well. Anything else, Jake, from you? I don't think we've no, got any questions. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, if people have got uh, questions or comments that they wanted to leave on the um, comment side in the chat, we um, can reply later maybe. But we want to thank you all for being um, sharing, being part of for listening to our session. And again, thank you to uh, Professor Ding and the team of the this year's Design Day Marathon and the sponsors for the opportunity to be a part of this year's event again. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Do we just leave the studio?